Fallout 2 is one of the best games of its era, with some of the best writing and one of the best worlds in the industry. And combining that with the engaging gameplay challenges, we have a game well worth anyone's time. With one of the few caveats being it is hard to learn how to play. However, once you get past the manual, you get a wealth of fun, discovery, and frustration, because this game is not your friend. It is your best friend, the kind of best friend that isn't afraid to make fun of you and give you a hard time. But of course, you can do the same. Have fun, explore the world and get power armor early to break the game's balance. But the game will humble you at every turn, whether it be a random patrol of violent power armored fascists, or a gecko that dodges every attack and keeps getting critical hits until you die. And if you learn how to play, this is all completely fair. And stupid. But fair. And this frustration makes success all the better. But we will talk about this all in due time, because the best place to start is the beginning. Speaking of the beginning, this seems like a lovely encounter. See, they're waving. The game starts with a character customization screen, and it's very similar to Fallout 1. The only real difference I noticed is a few changes to traits like the addition of sex appeal, the nerfing of skilled, and the removal of Night Person, because apparently everyone who stayed up past midnight died under mysterious circumstances. As you would expect, this is the most RPG RPG to have ever RPG'd, so it can be a little overwhelming without a guide. Just make sure to type in your name up here, and give yourself an agility of 9 or 10. I'll get into more detail in a bit, but I want to roleplay in this roleplaying game, so I'm going to go over my character lore for like 20 or 30 seconds, so skip ahead a little if you want. Now, of course, we are playing as the descendant of the Vault Dweller, the protagonist of Fallout 1. But apparently the Fallout 1 protagonist was a man, so if your Vault Dweller was a female, they became a trans man canonically. My Fallout 1 character, Tipo, was apparently a man then. Maybe he had that realization later in life after saving the world. Fun fact, a viewer in my comments of the first video said Tipo means a dude or a guy in Argentina. So I just stumbled into good writing and foreshadowing somehow. Also, you don't have to watch my Fallout 1 video to understand this one. I mentioned it like five times in total. Although if you know literally nothing about Fallout 1, you might be a little lost, so play Fallout 1 and 2 right now before I spoil everything. So with all that in mind, here's the character I played for this video essay... R review? This manic rant about how much I love this game. I came up with this character's name by randomly choosing a country and choosing a popular name from there, so I landed on New Zealand, the polar and idealistic opposite of Greenland, which is mildly amusing if you watched my Fallout 1 video. Anyway, this character's called Isla, and here's the briefest rundown of special. Strength is for loot goblins and melee builds, but because of power armor, never have strength above 6 or 7. Perception determines how often you get your turn and how accurate you are. Endurance is pretty simple, it's the don't die as fast stat. Charisma determines how many people you can have in your polycule. The number of companions you can have at the same time is half your charisma. It also affects how people react to you, whether you are sexy or an abomination, and also affects shop prices. Intelligence affects dialogue, as if you have a low intelligence you are barely capable of stringing words together. It also affects how many skill points you get per level, so it's pretty important to have it fairly high. However, it is not as important as agility. For the love of whatever you hold dear, do not put agility below 8. You see, every turn in combat, you have at least five action points to do with what you want, and agility is used to determine how many action points you get over five. For every two points of agility, you get an additional action point, which is critical to success. There is perks and drugs that also increase action points, but agility is still vital and affects your armor class and like half the skills in the game. And then there's luck. I'm not going to say anything about luck, except get luck 10 and jinxed and see the world fall apart around you. Speaking of jinxed, a lot of the traits explain themselves, so that saves me the work of explaining them and they do a good job of making each playthrough different depending on what you pick. Isla here has sex appeal and bloody mess. Make your disgusting jokes in the comments below. Skills are mostly self-explanatory. I tagged heavy weapons and melee because you only have melee weapons at the beginning of the game and they're fun, and big guns for late game fun. But nothing for mid game fun because this game isn't mid. There is a lot of skills, but if I had one critique of the system, it's that some of these skills are really strong like speech, which is pretty much mandatory, while other skills seem useless. I chose Repair in Fallout 1 and used it like two times. This game isn't much different and a companion can do Repair for you. And that's not even the worst one. Like, be honest, have you ever brought gambling above 100? If you need money, just sell a bunch of guns you get off of enemies. And why do Doctor and First Aid have to be separate? Doctor is for healing crippled limbs, but I never got a crippled limb during this playthrough. Thankfully, they were rolled into one stat in later games. So, enough about character creation, let's talk about the plot. After the Vault Dweller saved the world, he set up a new village called Arroyo. 
since he convinced other vault dwellers to follow him to settle a new land, and they are constantly at risk of famine. So basically, the vault dwellers successfully recreated Greenland. Now, it's not as cold as Greenland, although with how cold your aunt is, it's not far off. There is a famine and you need to get the Holy Gek in Vault 13, since you are the chosen one descended from the Vault Dweller, so apparently only you can save the village from ugly children and cow feces. You're told by the Elder that you must pass these trials to get your ancestor's Holy Vault suit and stuff, and this is the mandatory tutorial and it sucks. This is the main reason I don't start a new Fallout 2 playthrough a lot of the time. I could go into detail about why the Temple of Trials is bad, but the criticisms of this tutorial are well documented online, so I'll just summarize it as a severe lack of choices and an uncompromising attitude. They don't even give you a gun. This isn't your grandma's fallout from the year before. It doesn't matter what build you have. Pick up the spear. I don't care you have no melee skill or strength. Figure it out with all 10 intelligence you have, idiot. Also C4 is the solution to this terrible puzzle. That's actually a good lesson to teach. Explosives solve a lot of problems. It's worth mentioning though that there is one interesting bit at the end where you must fight this guy whose name I have forgotten. He says there will be moments in your journey where you have no choice but to fight someone, and so you have no choice but to fight him for your final trial. But you can actually talk him down, believing that a diplomatic solution is always possible, and this is quite a good indication of what is to come. But I have a few questions I hope you Fallout lore aficionados can answer in the comments below. How did this fully educated vault society devolve into tribalism in two generations? And how did they build a Temple of Trials with this level of detail when they are all dying of famine? Maybe if they put as much effort into their farming as they put into their masonry, the soil wouldn't be so poorly managed to the point of being completely infertile and need god-level fertilizer to restore. Like jeez, just use crop rotation! The Elder tells you that much knowledge has been lost to the great sands of time. It's been 80 years, Elder. Those people knew how to write stuff down, okay? You're just being lazy and not looking for the post-it note with the vault location. It's really funny how everyone in this town is crazy except you, and I get the impression the main character is the only sane one in this town, and has had to deal with everyone's stupidity and general helplessness their entire life because they are cursed with protagonist syndrome, where only they have the power and therefore the responsibility to look after these people. They call you Chosen One, but I think it's a scam to get you to do everything for them. Like, Hakunin wants me to do his gardening for him, the lazy oaf. Grab a spear and stab the plants yourself. By the way, you look sick in several meanings of the word, and you're too cryptic for your own good. Although, funnily enough, if you do have a low intelligence, he speaks clearer to you, and the village elder emphasizes words and repeats herself multiple times to get her point across. They think you are brain dead, but they entrusted the fate of the tribe to the village idiot, so I think they're the real idiots. Do a one intelligence run sometime, it's pretty funny. But I say it's time to journey out into the wastes. You start at the center north of the map, like Fallout 1. You just click in the direction you want to go, and if you know of somewhere, you can find it on the map, even if you haven't been there before. It's a good incentive to talk around towns to get directions, because otherwise, you just have to wing it and run around the wastes looking for the next town. But I wouldn't recommend that, and it becomes quite tense walking the wastes with limited equipment or low health. Because Fallout 2 is the kind of game that jumps you with geckos in your first time in the wasteland, and they avoid most of your attacks even though you have at least 65% shot at their head, and you can have 100 melee at the start of the game. The entire point of the first few hours is to make you feel disempowered, so the late game purge of the wasteland feels more rewarding. They don't even give you a gun immediately, and the first gun you are likely to find does barely any damage and can only hold one bullet before reloading. In a way, this game feels kind of like a speedrun of humanity's technological advancement with weaponry, with you going from spears to muskets to machine guns, and then eventually plasma weaponry. Some may say Fallout probably skipped a few steps in the tech tree there, but I call that sequence breaking. But enough about that. The game is gracious enough that it gives you a direction at the start. The first lead you get is about a trader called Vic in Klamath, a town of people living in bombed out houses claiming to be civilized and looking down on tribals. However, there is at least one interesting thing in this town. In a secluded area, you can find a downed helicopter called a Vertibird, with dead men in some strange power armor guarded by a robot. If you somehow kill this robot, which is pretty hard for how early in the game it is, you can get a yellow reactor keycard, something to hold on to for later. There's a few side quests here, one of them leads you to the toxic caves to save Smiley from geckos, aka God's mistake. They stay annoying in the late game with the fire geckos that do way too much damage. But past these reprehensible creatures, there's an interesting elevator which I need repair to use, so I should come back here later. But if I need repair, I should get Vic, who can repair stuff, and this is the only real reason you would want to find him. You can find Vic's very humble abode in Klamath, and you find out Vic is in the den, 
So you head there to find out he sold a broken radio to the Slaver Guild, who wanted to use the radio to pick up transmissions between New Reno and the earliest mention of a group called the Enclave that I know of. If you want to free him, you can help him fix the radio or give him a working radio you can get from his house. And then when you think it's all over, you need a thousand NCR dollars, not bottle caps, to buy him. So thanks, Vic, for being a burden. I didn't have enough of those already. So to get that money, you need to sell your morality a little in this den of scum and villainy. Maybe even join the slavers. But they insist on tattooing slaver on your forehead, so everyone knows you're a slaver. Which is weird and not good for getting new recruits. Like imagine if accountants were so cutthroat and exclusionary, that for them to know you are truly dedicated, you had to tattoo accountant on your head so you could never move on from that dark chapter of your life, and everyone knows what you did. But instead I perpetuated gang warfare to buy Vic's freedom. You can become a companion who helps with repair and very little else. While I'm here, I might as well discuss the den. The den is awful, and I say this because there are kids who pickpocket you, and if you try to take it back, the town turns on you, and if you kill them, you get the child killer perk which has consequences to say the least. There's also a Brother of Steel outpost in this really remote small town for whatever reason, and they're being weirdly cryptic. But before we leave, it's important to take note of that car. It needs a specific part to get working, but this will come in handy later. Also, cats are extinct on the west coast according to Stacy, but they're on the east coast in Fallout 4 at least. The next location is pretty far, and as you travel the empty wastes to your next destination, there's an overwhelming tense feeling like something bad will happen. And then suddenly... You have no idea what that thing was. You never knew something that big was possible, and he has two fully armored men flanking him, yet they feel inconsequential in comparison to that thing. And then he leaves, not even bothering to kill you. As this seemingly larger-than-life being leaves, you are reminded that you are nothing in the wastes. There is always another monster to face, and you've only just caught a glimpse of the biggest monster of all. Anyway, next stop is Vault City, where Vic gets all his vault tech merch. But on the way, we run into yet another town, and this one is dying of famine because of a conflict with a neighboring community and they kill each other if you don't act in time. And you have to get them to work together or else both groups die out. But I'll just skip over that. I just want to nitpick and say these early game towns all kind of blend together and aren't very distinguished from each other aesthetically. Like in Fallout 1, you can easily tell Shady Sands, Junk Town, and The Hub apart. But Fallout 2 makes up for these early game towns with its major settlements, which we are coming up on the first one now. Welcome to Vault City, a technologically advanced fascist regime that enslaves so-called savages and treats people like trash if they aren't born there. So you know, it's basically Japan. Also home to one of the best soundtracks in the game. And the first challenge of Vault City is getting in, because customs are typical for America. However, this is a good game and there are a lot of ways to get in, like fake documents, but I wouldn't recommend that. But these people are from a vault, so they probably have an interest in people from other vaults or anything to do with vault tech. So, I flash my vault suit to bypass the pesky custom workers by showing definitively that I am worth letting in. By the way, I forgot this was a solution, I just didn't get any armor yet. That's part of the joy of this game, is that you could just accidentally discover solutions you didn't know were possible. And also, I think it's a way to help out players who aren't doing so well at this point and haven't gotten armor yet. Fun fact, the citizens of Vault City are all narcs and won't let me in with any drugs or alcohol, so I treat Vic like a drug mule to get inside, and then I reunited him with his daughter as payment. I should probably meet with their leader, the first citizen. She must be a good leader, making time to see the common person. Just kidding, she is the second worst person in the world. She is condescending and racist, and if you say one wrong thing, she kicks you out of the city for good. Like if you are stupid enough to show her your fake citizenship papers. You need info from the vault computer, but only citizens could get access. And to become a citizen, much like modern day America, the standards are ridiculously high and you need to take a standardized test, which is tantamount to torture. So she offers a simple, easy alternative. Genocide. The local ghouls are running a nuclear power plant and are polluting the water supply of Vault City. She wants them gone, with peace not being an option for this genetic purist. But you seem to have no other choice. After all, she is the top dog around here. But there is some interesting politics going on. Make sure to remember McClure. But I am sure it will be fine if we exterminate the ghouls. Maybe they are evil and are doing it all on purpose. Hello there, smooth skin. The name's Harold. Oh my god, I it's Harold. Keep this town I can never kill Harold in cold blood. I have to help them.
Their nuclear reactor needs to be repaired with a part only Vault City can provide. But Vault City is one of the most racist cities in American history, about top 100, so they aren't open to trade and diplomacy from ghouls. This is just one of the many flavors of racism we will encounter on our journey. Also, this is a side note. You can find a ghoul who was in Necropolis in Fallout 1 and saw the Vault Dweller save the day, and you can invite him on your journey because he regrets not following the Vault Dweller back then. These people and their history they carry with them are precious, and I would sooner die than disappoint them. In fact, I would become one if that was an option. And the fact that the only game in the franchise that allows you to do this is Fallout Brothers of Steel is baffling. Now, if you want peace, this next bit is a bit obscure and you might need a wiki to figure it out. If you talk to everyone in this town, you will eventually find a ghoul called Gordon, who is obsessed about the moral necessity of greed and he has plans for a better world. More Vault City and Gecko get along. He gives you a holotape describing the economic benefits of trading power from the nuclear power plant to Vault City in return for medicine. It turns out Vault City needs more power to expand, and at the current rate of power consumption, they will burn out the reactor in 15 years. It's an incredibly beneficial deal for all parties involved, except of course for those people whose ideology is dependent on making other people like our ghoul friends seem like the enemy. So yeah, do not take this to the first citizen, because she's a real c- I'd say that on YouTube. Instead, take it to McClure the true hero of this world, who loves this plan and makes sure you become a citizen, and gets you the part the plant needs. Thanks McClure, you surprisingly good politician. I really hope no allegations come out now that I'm affiliated with you. So pick up the part and go back to Gecko for some nuclear engineering, and stumble upon other Poseidon oil sites through this terminal. Enclave here. Anyway, ignore that, fix everything and everyone lives happily ever after, give or take a few trips between Gecko and Vault City. As long as you didn't piss off the Enclave. Although, why does he wear full X01 power armor at his desk job? Also, people like to focus on him getting mad, but personally, I prefer the route where you just talk with him like a co-worker. Enclave here. Why isn't your video feed working? Yeah, sorry the camera isn't working. Well, your unit still doesn't appear to be operational, pal. Who is this? Nothing works like it used to, am I right? <sighs> Ain't it the truth. Just don't let anyone who's got the president's ear hear that. You'll be making cattle runs to New Reno till the end of time, pal. Yeah, man, the president really doesn't like criticism. It's crazy, right? Yeah, you know how unhappy he gets when people complain. He takes it personal, like it's a loyalty thing. Maybe that just goes with being the president of the United States, or what's left of him. Anyway, gotta go. Nice talking to you, man. I'm glad I made a new friend today. But if you don't mess it all up and call in a death squad or power plant failure, this brings an end to the conflict and is really nice story where neither society won't last much longer than 15 years if they don't cooperate according to Gordon's data. And once you, the player, do this quest, you'll be talking to everyone in every town all over the map to make sure you find all the solutions to every quest. Which is going to be a little bit painful because Vault City isn't even the biggest settlement. So you're going to be harassing random people for most of your time playing the game. But it is a nice way for the developers to teach you to engage with the world. I could go into everything going on in Vault City, like the NCR's shady tactics and how Vault City interacts with the other settlements, but I'll let you discover everything for yourself. But I will of course take the time to rub my citizenship in Lynette's face. She looks so unhappy I didn't do what she wanted. It brings me so much joy to upset this unpleasant- Jealousy. Damn it, he scares me every time! I had nightmares from the first time I played this game, and that's why I hate him. He keeps trying to micromanage me, and quite frankly, I don't respect him. Although he looks terrifying here. Can't have shit in the wasteland, not even my dreams are safe. All that's left that we need to cover here is the Vault data, which doesn't show Vault 13, but it does show Vault 15. But I want to head to New Reno first. Also, the irony that a shipment of water chips meant for Vault 13 going to Vault City by accident is hilarious. For a while. I'll get into that later. But before we leave the area, if you get a super toolbox from Vault City for Skeeter in Gecko, he gives you the car part that you need in the den. And you get the car and the best song in the game that every Fallout video essay ends with. Behold, my car. This bad boy allows you to travel way faster in the overworld with extra storage space in the boot. This baby can hold so much loot in it. Anyway, let's see how fast this is. It can't be that much faster than normal. There's no roads or infrastructure and it's mountainous terrain that has to slow us down. Holy shit, nothing can stop a highwayman! Oh, what's this? Oh, it's Redding. Never mind. The car is the best feature in the entire game! Welcome to New Reno, a city filled with opportunity. And I mean it, no two playthroughs of this game are the same by the time you're done with this place. There are so many crime families to join and betray. You can sleep with a crime boss's wife, you can steal another crime boss's oxygen tank to assassinate him, you can become a professional boxer, become a professional porn star, the possibilities are endless. 
but there is always one constant. I cuck Mr. Bishop in every single timeline. She even moans your name and the safe combination in her sleep, and I found out this playthrough that if you ask her the right questions, you can get an item that improves your speech skill. But there is only one way out, and that is through, and it is a nightmare to get through here. Those automatic weapons are lethal and can one-shot you in metal armor. You need power armor to get through here, so your wife is safe for now, Mr. Bishop. But anyway, we shouldn't spend any more time here. It's not necessary to do stuff in New Reno. Let's just go back to the car- I will dedicate my existence to vengeance, for as long as it takes me to ruin the life of whoever did this. There is several ways to find out where the car went. You can talk to the guide that stands here all the time, or find a snitch, or use your perception to follow the tracks to a chop shop. You can be diplomatic and smart about this, maybe buy back your car or pretend you're just picking it up for someone else, or have sex with this guy until his head explodes. That's not a joke, try it for yourself. You can even get your car upgraded, so it has more capacity for loot. However, I have a vendetta, and killed all of them since my capacity for mercy is currently full. But who was it anyway that wanted to buy my car? And now you know why I fuck his wife every playthrough. I believe this simple quest to get the car back is a beautiful example of the quests you get roped into in this game. You can of course ignore and go back to the relatively slow speeds of walking, but I would never do that. This is a fun way to force the player into fun and conflict by taking the one thing all players love hostage. New Reno is super dense with content, and part of that is thanks to the families, the Bishops, the Salvatores, the Wrights, and the Mordinos. And each of these families have different goals and strategies to take over New Reno. The Bishop's main goal is to bring New Reno into an alliance with the NCR and get a good deal with the government, hopefully legalizing gambling and prostitution, while ending the gang war anarchy in New Reno. The Salvatores are also collaborating with the government, but that government is more fascist, so I really don't like them. But they have an edge over the competition since they trade chemical components to these mysterious partners in exchange for laser weaponry. The rights are moonshiners who don't often accept people into their ranks, but that doesn't affect their numbers too bad since they have a really high birth rate for some reason. And the Mordinos had the guy who invented Jet. Who was that, you may ask? I don't know, history forgot them. So they peddle drugs and are trying to get gold from Reading by getting miners addicted to Jet. I wonder who I should pick. I hate Mr. Bishop. The rights are moonshiners that are probably a bit inbred. The Salvatories are led by a guy who can die any second, and they also die out shortly after this game, because a certain deal of theirs doesn't have a good long-term payout. So, with no other choice, I turn to the only person who will always accept me. Jesus. That's right. Jesus Mordino. More specifically, Big Jesus Mordino, because his son Lil Jesus Mordino is a prick. And also because Big Jesus Mordino has the exact same character model as Vic. The only downside is that they live on Virgin Street. However, Jesus is a little sexist, but I can prove myself to him by giving a mysterious package to a man who is clearly sober. These are the most clean and innocent criminals I have ever worked with. Because they aren't criminals. No government has labeled them so, since there isn't a government here. Yet. Anyway, turns out this is a plan to have that terrible guard OD and die as punishment. I think I may have just joined the war on drugs on the second worst side. I then had to get protection money from the porn studio. How nice of Jesus to look out for porn stars and protect them. What a swell guy. And as his final request, he asks me to kill a fascist collaborator. I mean the leader of the Salvatores, who's very close to death anyway, so if anything all I'm doing is simply giving him a nudge in the right direction. If they're already one foot in the grave, it's only a half murder. And again, I have to say, I love that one of the ways you could do this is stealing his oxygen tank without him noticing. That's good quest design, and a great option. He doesn't die immediately, so you could just leave before him or his goons notice. And so I became a made man of the Mordinos, and had the nickname of Guillotine. And the Mordinos have a long, prosperous reign in California. Right? It's not like the teenage wonder kid who invented jet dies, and then a cure for jet addiction is made. Right? I think that concludes the gangland violence I want to talk about. Well, except the mirrored shades that increase charisma, which you can get by grave robbing in Golgotha, where all the gangs bury the bodies of people who definitely died of natural causes. You see what the problem is here? I can't stop talking about this place. There's too much content to cover here, so here's a few highlights. Elton John is canon to the Fallout universe. You can become a porn star, but the requirements are really strict, like you have to base your whole build around it. When you become a made man, you can get some seriously good stuff from the gun store, like the Super Sledge, which enables me to go body bowling, Mario and Luigi Bowser's Inside Story is the greatest game ever made, and of course, my boxing adventures, where you have a wide array of boxer names, one of them is Black Widow, which I, I think is pretty cool. More perks in future games should be named after these nicknames. But the nickname I went with was Valkyrie, which is also sounds like a really cool perk name. Anyway, Isla here is 126 pounds, and Jock is 181 pounds. I'm pretty sure that is a weight class violation. 
Oh, never mind, there is no strategy. Just repeatedly go for the head until they get knocked out. Just gotta remember to heal between rounds and big Jesus Mordino, not now Hakunin! Alright, Hakunin aside, um, time for my final fight in the ring against the Masticator. I feel really sorry for whoever paid to see the match of the century because it ended in two seconds because Valkyrie got a lucky shot in at his head. And of course, the highlight of New Reno, Mrs. Bishop. Actually, I want to take this moment to say you can sleep with Mrs. Bishop regardless of player gender. And in Modoc, the world's least significant town, you can get roped into a shotgun wedding and get a wife or husband, regardless of your character gender. This game being so open to being gay is quite refreshing and unexpected for the time, and I appreciate that. Also, small tangent within this tangent, in a dungeon that was cut from the game, you could change your character's appearance and gender, but it was cut for time. So the Fallout 2 restoration mod put it back in. After that weird detour into organized crime, you may think it's time to talk about Vault 15, the lead you can get two towns ago, but you would be wrong. I want to talk about some more organized crime. And by that I mean the Californian government. Because next on the list of places to go is the NCR, or as it was formerly known as, Shady Sands. And this place has so many references to Fallout 1. They even have a statue of the Vault Dweller outside City Hall. And I can talk to the Brotherhood again, but they are as cryptic as always. But of course, the most important person here is President Tandy. And she gives you context as to what happened in Fallout 1. And I think it's nice the Elders of Arroyo told the Chosen One about her. She had a fairly minor role in Fallout 1, and it's nice to see she is remembered, and then became the president of 700,000 citizens. That's incredible. Good for her. Anyway, Tandy has a special job for us. It's a tale as old as time. A battle going back decades between the Californian government and homeless people. The NCR needs computer parts from their old vault, Vault 15, because the graphics card market has probably exploded again, but the squatters outside won't let anyone in, and well, the graphics cards might be worth more than their lives to the government. But they can't exactly leave. They have no survival skills or supplies and are completely reliant on the vault for survival. But that leaves a few questions for the player to ponder. As we see in Fallout 1, everything in the vault is either broken or of no use to them, and any food or water stores would have run out or rotted long ago, and it's been a long time since Fallout 1. So how are they surviving? And why are they in tents outside of the vault? Well, if you press the squatters, you find out why. While Tandy was saved and her Republic was built, the enemies of Shady Sands weren't all dead and buried, although they did go underground. For as incredible as the Vault Dweller was, they made at least one mistake, as we see the return of the Great Khans. The Khans have done what they will continue to do for the entire series. Endure. There was a single survivor from Fallout 1, and he rebuilt it all in the ruins of Vault 15. Gotta respect it though, that takes some serious willpower and dedication. He is nearly a hundred years old and kept together by a slave doctor and spite. He is consumed with vengeance against the NCR and the Vault Dweller, so there is no reasoning with him. So he shall face the same fate as his old family, being crushed by the descendant of the original Vault Dweller, perpetuating the cycle of violence once more. Alternatively, you can just take the computer parts and leave. Oh, and also get the location of Vault 13 as well. I guess I should advance the plot while I'm here. Now, you may be wondering what happens to the homeless in California. Well, they get ignored to death. But in this case, for once you can work out a deal between the government and homeless people where the government helps out the homeless at Vault 15 with survival, and in turn, the NCR gets old computer parts from the vault. All that requires is you killing the newly remade Great Khans who are holding these people hostage. Wait a minute, why does that last bit sound familiar? Can't wait until Chrissy becomes the leader of Arizona! The parallels with Fallout 1 are amazing. At the beginning of Fallout, you start at the very top of the map, and now the top of Fallout 1 is the very bottom of Fallout 2, with old conflicts seemingly still going on, and we will see this play out as the game advances. It's also at this part of the game, where money stops being a problem, as I loot all of their guns and get 10 grand from the NCR, you can get a car upgrade called Claudia that boosts the highwayman speed, and that's only like $1,500. You never have to worry about money ever again except for buying fuel for the car or an occasional bit of ammo for your guns. Here's a few quick notes about the NCR. You can talk to the Brotherhood again, and they have been observing you, and they offer one answer to any question. You can talk down a man with a bomb, and a bunch more, but I can only make this video so long, so discover the NCR for yourself. So I shall demand this again, play the game. I don't care if you don't have a PC, find a potato or a computer of comparable power and start playing Fallout 1 and 2 on it! Actually, you know what, let's do Fallout 1 again. Here's Vault 13 in the cave outside. Home sweet home. 
I wonder how everyone is doing. Oh, shit. Oh, never mind. These guys are far more pleasant than the previous occupants. Now, some people were disappointed I didn't kill the Overseer in Fallout 1, but I assure you, a much worse fate awaited him inside the vault. You see, after banishing the hero of the vault, people were understandably quite upset. So they had a split. Some went with Tipo and others overthrew the Overseer and installed a computer from the Brotherhood to run things. And then the Enclave killed and kidnapped them all. Which brings us to these lovely folks. These Deathclaws were mutated with FEV by the Enclave to become smarter so they could follow orders. But they became too smart, smart enough to escape from slavery after the Enclave captured the Vault Citizens, so they took up residency here. However, claws aren't great for keyboards, so they used the voice recognition module on the new Overseer. However, it stopped working, so you must fix it for them, and they will search for the Gek in the Vault. However, I doubt it will result in actually getting it like every time before this. But make sure to explore Vault 13 thoroughly as soon as you can, it's great. Also, I checked the Vault storage and found a spare water chip. This game really likes the joke about the inciting incident of Fallout 1 being easily avoidable. The Overseer couldn't be bothered to check between the couch cushions for spare water chips, and the Vault Dweller went in the opposite direction of most of the world's water chips. But enough about that. It's a small thing, and the plot of Fallout 1 goes beyond the water running out. And besides, all the more reason to hate the old Overseer and praise the new Overseer, which needs repairs. Using Vic and my repair skill, we find it was damaged by sabotage. I think that plot thread goes somewhere, but I can't be bothered to figure it out. This video is going to be an hour long at this point. But that's fine, I heard of the replacement part back in Reno. So we should go and pick that up. But before we go, how about we get my favourite companion in the game. Hell, probably the entire series. Goris, the Deathclaw Scholar, who wants to journey with me to compare Deathclaw society to our own. He's great, I love him. Especially because at the start of combat, he throws off his robe like some kind of wrestler. He also tells me of a certain military base to the west of Vault 13, where he thinks the FEV is from, and that the Enclave has taken an interest in it. Anyway, I'll just pop over to Reno to pick up that part and- God damn it, Hakunin, not now! I don't care that the village is in trouble. I'm trying to save the Deathclaw Society. Why do you keep doing this to me? Why can't you just leave me alone? What do you even want? You're not helping by doing this. Every time you contact me, I go on yet another detour because you're so insufferable you make me never want to go back to Arroyo. Yeah, that's right. Fuck off out of my dreams. Also on the way back, I got jumped by the Yakuza and Ron Perlman gave spoilers for what happens next. Skip a few seconds ahead if you don't already know what happens in this game. You have died. You shall never know what happened to your kidnapped village. What the fuck, Ron? That's not happening for another paragraph in the script. We'll just plug that part in, and yeah, that's all solved, and anyway, just tell me where to go next for the Gek- Oh, you actually had it. Didn't expect this. Well, I guess that proves Deathclaws are more reliable and trustworthy than humans. Kinda expected Hakunin to harass me again. I wonder what's happening. It's kinda odd the game is coming to an end. I feel like it's the halfway point. Well, anyway, I hope for the best for you, Deathclaw Society. Nothing bad could possibly happen. Okay, so something bad happened, and honestly, Hakunin, you deserve this. You've done nothing but interrupt my journey with your constant cryptic calls and negative attitude, but whoever designed your model did a fantastic job. You look sick in every sense of the word now. So yeah, what happened? Dark Souls. Dark Souls? So yeah, the Dark Souls of Man kidnapped the village. Not a big deal, honestly, nothing of value was lost. Although, before this, I had an encounter with the head of the Vault Dweller. It was weird, but I got the monument chunk, so I let it rest with Hakunin as a final thank you, and put him to rest with our hero. Just kidding, I can use it for a boost in damage resistance later. Hope you enjoy dealing with your guard in the afterlife, Hakunin. You piece of excrement. I'm limiting the amount of swears I can use in a video now. It's, it's not, it's taken a lot out of me. But before we finish the game, I'm going to use this time to explore the map and type a few loose ends, starting with the Toxic Caves, where I exact my revenge on the geckos, and fix a generator. Now I can finally explore this weird elevator I found at the beginning of the game and has been tormenting me the entire... I need an electric lockpick. I guess I'll be back later. So let's see some side quests in the meantime. Which honestly, the side content is just as good as the main content in this game, so as far as I'm concerned, this is a good thing. Just an excuse to play more of this wonderful game, which you should play already. Like, for example, Redding has a problem with the weirdest enemies in Fallout history. The Wanamingos. Even Vats doesn't know what they are. They might be aliens? They certainly took inspiration from aliens. I don't know. Tell me in the comments below, please. But what I do know is, they are tough. They go through armor with their weird tentacles and they have large numbers with even larger health pools. Even Gorus the Deathclaw Scholar struggles with them, but 
they blow up in a satisfying way. Pay is terrible though, only a thousand dollars. Although it was all worth it because of one moment when Vic went up to one, put his shotgun away, then scratched his ass, before running away again leaving me for dead. So thanks Vic. Really taking one for the team. Anyway, this random kid is complaining about his dad Melchior the Magnificent being kidnapped by some strange folks and he misses him because he liked his magic tricks. Probably just a dumb reference to something, this won't be relevant. Back to my wonderful wasteland adventure instead of saving my stupid tribe. Oh, Gorse has to go check in his tribe. I should go with him to see how they're doing. What, what happened here? Why is there blood everywhere? Where is all my friends? Gorus, what happened here? It's him again. And he punched a death claw. And it exploded? He is a monster. Gorus and I shall avenge these brave, honorable people and take out the Enclave, no matter the cost. They have taken things too far this time. But for that, we need help. While Vic has been useful for some repair checks, he doesn't quite have the firepower to keep up. So it's time I got one of the best companions in the game, in Broken Hills. This is a society where ghouls, superhumans, humans, and a scorpion that cheats at chess coexist to mine and sell uranium ore for the other major settlements for nuclear reactors. This town is proof that peace works with every race having a job and being treated equally. The supermutants and ghouls mine the ore since they are naturally resistant to the effects of radiation, and supermutants are stronger, perfect for manual labor like this. The humans take care of trading since the other settlements don't trust non-humans, since Homo sapiens have a habit of killing off their close relatives of their species. Although sometimes we integrate them into our society as well, since we have a little bit of Neanderthal in our DNA. Anyway, hopefully we can peacefully coexist with our new relatives this time around. But the reason I'm here is Marcus. What do you want, human? He is a chill guy who teaches you about the history of Fallout, and about the origins of this town that he founded with his friend Jacob from the Brotherhood of Steel. And you may notice that Marcus founds another town in Fallout New Vegas called Jacobstown, and I think that's just beautiful. He's one of my favorite characters in the entire franchise. Also a little side note, in this town there's also a talking plant who teaches you how to beat a scorpion at chess, so you can kill it to steal its glasses when it gets mad at you. However, despite this town being objectively great, there are two major problems here. The mine air purifier is not working, and people are going missing. Marcus offers to pay for helping with the missing people, but I offer to do it for free, because Marcus is a friend, and money has lost all meaning to me. I won't go into all the steps of this quest, but it boils down to this. There is a mutant-hating faction of humans who sabotaged the air purifier, led by Jacob, but not the cool Jacob. This is the racist Jacob at the pharmacy. So some mutants led by Francis catch on and don't tell Marcus as they don't have sufficient proof, and Marcus is apparently too honest to plant evidence. So they kill a few mutant-hating people and try to frame the anti-mutant faction to arrest the saboteurs and prevent a race war. You can hand this evidence straight to Marcus and have Francis arrested, or you can let Francis flee to the wastes to atone for his sins. Either way, the quest is complete and a race war is averted. You can also side with the racist humans, but I will judge you severely for that one. I am still shocked this game has a beautiful complex racial conflict as a side plot. The writing and world building in this game is incredible. Oh, and the other quest to fix the air filter. Get the parts from Reno and fix it. Who needs PPE? What's a little radon poisoning going to do to you? Anyway, we came to this town for a reason, and it wasn't to solve literally all their problems. We came here for a new companion, but I have a charisma of four, and can only have two companions at the same time, and I'm not getting rid of Gorus. I'm sorry, Vic, but someone has to go. But I will remember you fondly. You only occasionally shot me in the back, and you helped me with repair skill checks from time to time. But there isn't enough room in the back seat for you and a Deathclaw and a Super Mutant with a minigun. I'll let you retire in this town. They need a repairman if the air purifier is anything to go by. But you can keep the shotgun as a pension plan. You served me well, Vic, but it's time for you to go. I'll always remember you. It's a testament to this game's ability to make compelling characters that I actually feel bad for leaving a friend behind 
even if he did stab me in the back several times. Anyway, it's time for Marcus. Okay, Marcus, you're on thin ice, buddy. All right, what's next? Well, but I'm not ready for the military base. So welcome to San Francisco. Before we discuss this place, just go into this store and buy power armor, which is kind of an underwhelming way to get power armor, but whatever, I get to clear out all my excess weapons. But I have seen speedrunners rush to San Francisco, plant C4 in this guy's pants so he blows up, then stay outside of town for a few days so people don't care about the murder, and then they go back and loot everything. But enough about that, now I'm ready to take on the world. More specifically, the military base. This place is a nightmare. It's just as hard as Fallout 1, and these suit immunes get to move so many times and have a good chance of getting a crit. But here's the secret ingredient to get past all of this. It's called drugs. Also, the game kept crashing here for some reason. Anyway, it turns out the Enclave was here excavating the base to get a pure sample of FEV. They kidnapped some miners from Reading to excavate, and that didn't end so well. The miners mutated into second generation super mutants and super duper mutants. Kinda wish I could play one of these games as a super mutant. And no, the bad ending of Fallout 1 doesn't count. Not that I would want to be a second generation super mutant. They weren't hand picked unirradiated specimens like the first generation were, and they weren't exactly dipped in a controlled fashion, so they're a little stupider than Gen 1 mutants. Didn't need much intelligence to beat the Enclave though, as they had to leave. But despite the uprising, the Enclave got what they were looking for, and sealed the entrance. And to get in, you have to do this weird but wonderful puzzle. So you see this minecart? Well, what you need to do is grab this metal pole that blends in perfectly with the terrain, and then attach it to the minecart. And then, you grab some dynamite from this locked shack, or if you already have some, attach it to the stick, and then, with strength greater than six, push the minecart into the rock wall, and then you can go inside. The developers really wanted to keep you out until you are ready. This is the game design equivalent of airport security, and even when you get inside, you have to use repair to turn the lights on. I kind of miss you, Vic, although I have enough repair to do it myself now. So after the hellish yet familiar fight through Mariposa, which gets me a minigun, I eventually get to the bottom, and oh, it's just a single super mutant called Melchior. This should be easy. Let's beat him up. And what is he saying about his pets? Oh dear God, he summons death claws. Oh no. Goris is dead. Marcus isn't here yet, and Melchior also summoned four death claws in one turn. That kid wasn't making a silly reference. He was giving me a warning. Welcome to one of the most bullshit fights in gaming. He can summon two death claws a turn, and apparently after four death claws, he summons less terrifying monsters. But I have never gotten that far. He also snipes you with a laser rifle, and I'm going to be honest, I have never beaten him before. Well, not until this playthrough. You see, I found a strat to beat him. It's called getting lucky and killing him before he can summon his pets. So, I hope that adequately shows the power of the minigun. You can't do targeted attacks, but when the minigun gets a crit, barely anything can survive. So, I wonder what he was guarding anyway. I've actually never seen this before, so I wonder what it is. Of course it's a pistol I can't use. Why would it be anything else? So, yeah, that's Mariposa Fallout 2 edition. Uh, it's a lot simpler than before because all the traps and force fields are gone, so you just kind of walk through it. But there's plenty of good loot in it. Like, say, the power armor that's in those lockers, but I'm not getting it. Quick question though, why don't I turn into a super mutant when I go into the FEV room? Before I can find out why, I return to San Francisco, which is the last major settlement in the game, and in my opinion, the second best after New Reno but I will let you discover it for yourself because I'm so nice and don't want to spoil the fun for you. And this video has been in production for nine months as of recording this part. Anyway, here's the Brotherhood of Steel's final outpost in the game, and now they are being very straightforward with me for once. Matthew here answers all of my questions and tells me that the Brotherhood has been on decline since Fallout 1, since they thought they were the only source of advanced technology in the wasteland and that nothing is a threat. But then the Enclave arrived, and the Brotherhood had to take on a more cautious role. The Enclave are even more technologically advanced than them. They considered reaching out, but they decided they needed more info first. So they set up outposts in areas of high Enclave activity. These were The Den, NCR, and San Francisco. And they found out the Enclave dealt in slaves, drugs, and weapons. This is why the Brotherhood had an outpost in The Den. It was to keep an eye on the slavers. 
It's also why Metzger wanted to tap into Enclave radio signals. And perhaps that is why the village of Arroyo was kidnapped. The Enclave needs people from the Wasteland for some reason. What that reason is, the Brotherhood doesn't know yet. Next, the Enclave sold laser pistols to the Salvatores in exchange for chemicals and tipped the balance of power in Urino in the Salvatore's favour. But the Brotherhood doesn't know what it's all building towards. This is a fascinating side to the Brotherhood of Steel that isn't really explored after this game. They are at a military disadvantage, so they have to resort to subterfuge and gathering as much intel as possible. I'm surprised there isn't much of that in New Vegas, where they were a small group who had to stay hidden to survive. There are small amounts of it, with patrols going around and Veronica staying hidden in plain sight, but other than that, there isn't much like this. I also appreciate this is a continuation of their more open stance from the end of Fallout 1 where they are actively engaging with the world now and trying to deal with any threats that arise as opposed to just trying to outlast their enemies. They have realized that is a failing tactic and have moved on. Until Fallout Tactics, which saw them have a schism over it or something. I don't know, I haven't played through that game fully. I get to the third mission and quit. Meanwhile, Fallout 3 in New Vegas is guilty of this where the Western Brotherhood seemingly forgets their character arc. But Fallout 3 and 4 don't even follow the Western Brotherhood of Steel. They followed the Eastern Coast Brotherhood, which is basically an entirely different organization at this point. But at least the Fallout 3 Brotherhood of Steel follows on from the character arc of Fallout 1's Brotherhood of Steel, although it does say the Western Coast Brotherhood has reverted to their old ways. And then in Fallout 4, they go in an interesting direction where the Brotherhood goes on Crusade, which I think is pretty fun. Okay, I'm going on a tangent. This is also the part of the video where you expect me to talk about the Fallout TV show, but I wrote this script almost a year ago and there's already more than enough on the Brotherhood here relative to their impact on the game. But I'd be happy to give all my thoughts on the Brotherhood in a separate video sometime if that's something you're interested in. But that is a story for another day. Back to the Brotherhood in Fallout 2 specifically, instead of about the entire franchise. They have another major concern with the Enclave, which is Vertibirds. The Enclave can basically deploy anywhere they want, and that is a terrifying thing to the Brotherhood, who have no counter to this. So they kindly ask you to infiltrate Navarro for them. A base on the coast, close-ish to San Francisco, that belongs to the Enclave. It is mentioned a few times, and Hakunin straight up tells you where it is, but that feels anticlimactic, and I'm not going there for him, okay? I'm going there for me and my Deathclaw friends. And also because Matthew told me if I get the vertebrate plans for the Brotherhood, they'll give me access to all their cool tech. Also, infiltrating Navarro will get me all the Enclave's cool tech as well. We have graduated from spear to musket to automatic weapons and now plasma weapons and power armor. Or in my case, power armor and the super sledge I got on New Reno. So I guess this isn't much of a technological leap forward for me as a mainly melee character. The first half of this game is in the most remote and unadvanced place in America. And then as the game goes on, technology just keeps getting more and more common and advanced. The difference between Arroyo and Navarro is astronomical, but let's talk about how incredible Navarro is from a gameplay perspective. When you get there, you are confronted by Chris, who tells you you're in the wrong place, but you can convince him you are a new recruit and he gives you a password you can use to get into the base, where you meet the man who launched a thousand memes. Welcome to Camp Navarro. So you're the replacement. What's your name, Private? Here's my name. What was that? Did you forget something, maggot? I mean, yes, sir. I am not his sir! I work for a living, you moron! You will call me Sergeant, or Sergeant Dornan! Do you understand me? I'm sorry, Sergeant, I'm just new here and just... Please don't be mad at me. You the double to the hangar, where you will stand guard duty! You will do a fine job! Do you understand? And so I stayed there, on guard duty, for the rest of my days. Too afraid to move, just, just in case Sergeant Arch Dornan checked in on me. But in an alternate reality, by using my irresistible charms, I got the vertebrate plans and went back to my post before my superior returned. He does laps around the base, and I am terrified of not being at my post when he returns. Thankfully, no one here is a narc, and the guards just let me go by them, no questions asked. So I go to the basement. Now the surface level seems like a fairly small base. But then the sub-level has a whole lab, armory, and living quarters. The lab has a cyborg dog you can get as a companion, there is Deathclaw experiments with a side quest attached, and a computer which tells me exactly where the Enclave main base is. Apparently it's in the middle of the ocean with two methods of getting there. Vertibird, or the ship in San Francisco, but you need some parts for that. And one of those parts, the fob, is in the commander's office, which is tricky to get, but I have the speech to convince them it needs to be relocated and secured. And I have just so happened to be the one picking it up. Navarro is wonderful because there are so many options to get through it. Because if you take the obvious path of most resistance, you get killed in one turn. Those plasma turrets are brutal. One of the other ways of getting in is you can sneak in through a secret tunnel. And as long as you are in power armor, 
They think you belong. Although the Quartermaster does comment on how ancient your power armor is if you're in T-51. So it gives you access to the armory to get advanced power armor and plasma weaponry and basically everything you could ever want. Even a blue memory module, which I'll explain what the memory modules are later. I also picked up a green one in Mariposa, and another one in Vault 13. I think there's a red one in Vault City, but I didn't get that one. But back to Navarro, it is a wonderful place, and I love it. And there is one last thing to do. Which is to strip out of the power armor, and talk to the Sarge! Welcome to Camp Navarro! So you're the new replacement! You are out of uniform, soldier! Where is your power armor?! This is what happened canonically. A former member of the Enclave in New Vegas talks about this inspiring yet terrifying tirade against this new recruit, but at least there is a timeline where I kill him. After all that, you return to Matt and give him the schematics, and he gives access to the Brotherhood base, where I get outdated power armor, and these pulse weapons that are really strong. I use them for the rest of my first playthrough once I got them. This place kind of acts like a player home since you can get healed for free and it has storage lockers for loot. But most importantly in the space is a computer called Ace, and they can give you info about the world and AI, and if you bring them the memory modules you pick up around the world, they can upgrade stats, so I spent five weeks in a tank. And during that time, Matt fucking died, and Marcus and Goris are just chilling. So ply the Enclave to leave me and my friends alone. But at least Matt went down fighting. And oh how nice. At least he has a good relationship with his workers, and they get a decent lunchtime. I think I like the Enclave now, honestly, you know, it's pretty good. Although, quick question, how did he get in here? He is huge, he would have been seen by the locals and the security forces, and these doors are too small for him, and the elevator probably wasn't built for something so heavy, and two additional guys in power armor with heavy weapons. L like, how did he get in? Did the developers not think about the... Okay, yeah, that actually makes sense. I, th I think I'm the only one that cares about this. Also, it's worth mentioning that the other two Brotherhood bases are empty shells, which is kind of disappointing, but this much loot three times over would be ridiculous. Now, on to San Francisco as a whole. A Chinese submarine at the end of the Great War was stranded here, so the crew set up a new society and called themselves the Xi. And they have quite a bit of technology and scientific know-how, since they were all military personnel and scientists on a nuclear submarine. So they had a pretty good society set up, with the people flocking to join them. And their scientists are genetically engineering plants, and are actually one of the few societies advancing technology in the entire Fallout universe. They are led by the mysterious Emperor, and he's one of your best leads to find out where your people went. Unfortunately, he doesn't accept visitors. You have to go through his second in command, who asks for the vertebrate plans I already have. So that's one step already taken care of. And then he asks for a second task. To kill the leader of the Scientologists, I mean Hobologists, who are definitely not a stand-in for a real-life organization. Anyway, I won't go into detail on them, because that would require research into something other than video games. But they want to repair their spaceship, and they reappear in Fallout 4 Nuka World DLC. You can side with them against the Xi, but I never do that. I don't even know what they ask of you, other than fixing the spaceship. Go discover that for yourself when you play the game. Because you will play the game. You're this far into a video on Fallout 2, you clearly have an interest in playing it, or already have played it, so boot it up and start that new playthrough. But have this video on in the background or something, I need the watch time. And also subscribe, that'd be cool of you. Anyway, one slaughter later, or the super stimpack strat to kill their leader quietly, I return to the Xi. Skip ahead a bit if you don't want the twist spoiled. It's revealed that the Emperor is a computer. They use that computer for science and general ideas, while the scientists take into account human nature and other factors that AI cannot account for. They use AI like a tool. Which it is. They're actually using AI correctly instead of hitting a button and taking the result as gospel. The Emperor tells us where the villagers are, and that the Enclave is stronger than we think, and that I have a 15% chance of succeeding. But there is only one viable way to the Enclave, and that is the oil tanker because the submarine has a 0% chance of appearing in this game. The oil tanker is full of people who now live there and set up shops, and it's quite a lovely society. But the captain won't even talk to me unless I help his buddies. But I'm pretty sure his friend here in the void is beyond help. So I do the second best thing of cleaning out the lower decks of one amingos, centaurs, uh, those things, and is that a vault or- Ed! What's going on down here? When you speak to the captain after some minor pest control, he gives you a checklist of stuff you need to get to this boat operational and ready to go to the Enclave oil rig. And he used to work for the Enclave and that's how he knows what to get and how to get there. You need the fob, which I got from Navarro. You need to get fuel, which you get from either the Emperor or Hobologists. And you need navcom parts, 
which you get from Vault 13. This is the final part of the game, and it is a victory lap as you go to places from the beginning of the game and decimate everything. It's like those fantasies where you beat up your bullies from school. Hey Mr. Bishop, come to fuck your wife. By the way, I think it's canon that the Chosen One gets either Leslie Bishop or Angela Bishop pregnant. But Angela deserves better than this life, so I actually snuck out and convinced her to leave. Her safety is what's most important. I'll make sure he can't follow her later. By the way, one more note on Reno, because I haven't talked about it enough this video. If you go to Reno in your next playthrough, I recommend going with the Rites, as they send you to a cool dungeon, but I recommend a very high science skill for that, but it is worth it. Also, when I went back to the NCR, the police opened fire on me and my companions for literally no reason. I think it was racially motivated against Deathclaws and Super Mutants. The middle and western parts of the map are surprisingly empty, considering how much is in the eastern half. You have Vault City, New Reno, and the NCR, and a bunch of smaller settlements. In fact, the political actions of these factions is really cool and well thought out from a story point of view. Like, they are all fighting over Redding, which has a gold mine, and they have different approaches. The Mordinos in New Reno are getting the miners addicted to Jet to make them dependent on them. The NCR is making deals with the mine owners, and Vault City is probably doing something too, but no one cares about them. In fact, they are the weakest of the three major factions, as they are being pressured heavily into joining the NCR, since they can't even defend themselves from raiders. But I say go investigate the raider trouble for yourself, because there is layers to the wasteland politics here that you have to unravel for yourself. And I think it's some of the strongest writing in the series, and it's completely optional, even though the consequences of these things are huge for the wasteland as a whole. But there isn't really a reward worth your time at this stage of the game, as your equipment is as good as it gets and the money is worthless outside of ammo and fuel for your car. However, there is one thing worth doing. I have been waiting to do this all video. I finally have an electric lockpick to get past those doors in the toxic caves from all the way at the beginning of the game. And beyond those doors is... What the hell is that? Why can it launch three missiles in a single turn? How is this still so hard this late into the game? But since it's so difficult, there must be good loot, right? Oh, it's a cool gun and combat armor. Well, the combat armor is worse than my power armor, and the Bozar looks like a sniper rifle, so it probably isn't a big gun. So after all that wondering what was down here the entire game, this place was a waste of time for me. But hey, it might be of use for you next time you play this game. But I think that's finally enough meandering around the wasteland. I can't put it off any longer. It's time for the final confrontation with the Enclave, and what a fantastic final confrontation it is. With the oil from the Shi, the fob from Navarro, and the navcom parts from Vault 13, we turn this old ship back online, and I love it. Something about old equipment in a post-apocalyptic setting still working after so much time satisfies me. Like, just saying this was built to last makes me happy on a level I cannot understand. Also, this cutscene is probably my favorite in the entire game, so I'm gonna let the whole thing play out. I won't speak for all of it, but it does a pretty good job of speaking for itself, I think. Although, we probably should have told people we were doing this, because I feel like we've skipped over a lot of steps and, like, procedures about safety of, of taking off in a ship. This doesn't feel safe at all, but regardless, with the triumphant score and blatant disregard for dock safety, we sail into the sunset ready to face the Enclave. Wait, did we evacuate the boat? Are the Vagrants still on it? Are we taking them to their deaths? Eh, it'd probably be alright. You arrive at the Enclave oil rig in the dead of night, with the sheer size of it and ominous atmosphere being portrayed perfectly, with its shadowy shape and the floodlights turning on to illuminate your ship. This ship is huge, but it's tiny in comparison to the oil rig. And the chilling sight that you've recognized by the oil rig for the silent relief as the fob gets you in without raising the alarm, followed with an unsettling welcome to the Enclave.
But they have to know we're here, right? I mean, the floodlights and giant ship probably woke several people up. Marcus, Scores, stay here. I have to do this alone, you'll break my cover. Because inside, they don't acknowledge you so long as you wear power armor. Just like Navarro. And, oh hey, my village is here with Vault 13 dwellers. I wasn't looking for them, but hey, who am I to complain? Hey, Elder, how's it going? Hurry. Yeah, that sounds about right. Well, time to ignore them as usual. The Enclave main base is an isolated, technologically advanced oil rig. A place separated from the consequences of the world they are responsible for creating. And symbolizes everything they build. And it is constructed like an impenetrable fortress that is nearly impossible to get through. This room in particular can go fuck itself? Why did they build this here? I don't think this electrified puzzle maze between the armory and living quarters is conducive to a good and healthy work environment. But at least you get a bunch of loot, like a spare geck in case you didn't find the other one. And advanced power armor Mark II, which is even better than the suit you get at Navarro. But beyond this terrible maze, we can go down another level in the base where we find the Vice President, who is crazy and follows Elon Musk on Twitter, as he has plans of leaving the Earth after trashing the place and setting up on Mars with the world's least thought out plans. But beyond him is the President of the United States of America, who is kind enough to make time for one of the troops. He must surely be a man of the people, just kidding, he is the worst person in the world. He even looks and sounds like every horrible US politician rolled into one person. What can the President of the United States of America do for you? Believe it or not, this man has a charisma of nine. But talking with him is interesting, as he talks about his version of history and how only the untainted humans have a right to the planet. And there is no way to reason with him, because his position isn't based on reason. You can't debate this crotchety old fossil of a bygone era. He isn't like the master from Fallout 1 where you can talk him down by empirically proving he's doomed to fail. But like the master from Fallout 1, he is a great villain, mainly because of what he represents. To put it bluntly, it's people in power not having the mental or emotional capacity to care about the people they have power over and making horrific decisions that drastically alter the lives of numbers they don't see as people. He is a cold, calculating madman that no one in the wasteland will ever meet, yet his decisions determine whether they live or die. And no matter what he chooses, he'll say it was for the greater good and not even think about the damage he causes. And why should he? His way of doing things is the only way things should be done. He knows what's best for America, and everyone in his way should simply go along with it, even if it means they will die because that is a sacrifice he is willing to make. Speaking of, he will monologue about his master plan and the history of the Enclave. He reveals the vaults were mostly tests, and Vault 13 was a control group and contained perfect test subjects and nothing more. The master plan, as it were, is to get a pure FEV sample from Mariposa, get chemical supplies from Nurino, and make a deadly modified FEV strain, which they then test on slaves from the Den and an unmutated human population from Vault 13 and recently mutated humans from Arroyo. And then they released this modified FEV into the atmosphere, and let the air currents transport it around the world where it will kill all non-inoculated humans. And it would take about a month to purge the planet of the supposedly impure. Like most politicians, he claims to be making the hard choices, but he really isn't. He is taking the easy way out. Which is easier? Reaching out to work with your neighbors, moving past your differences to improve your community for everyone, or killing them all with a sniper rifle from 50 kilometers away and taking everything for yourself. The problem with the Enclave, the NCR, and even the Brotherhood is that they cling to a past that can never be recreated or is never truly real. They wish to go back instead of forward because the future is uncertain and there are a few terrifying creatures out there. But we can overcome this, or as Vault 13 and the Sheep prove, we can cooperate and live in tandem with nature as we are both horribly scarred from this nuclear experience and should probably work together to recover from it. In this new world, life has begun anew. It's taken weird and wonderful shapes that have never been seen before. Sure, every species that has been lost is mostly irreplaceable, but so is the life of this new world and it's beautiful and something to be treasured. Except the Wanamingos, I don't think they serve a purpose in the food chain, we can just eliminate them. A common theme of this game is that civilization is doomed if we do not work together. Several societies will die out if they don't get along with their neighbours. If Modok and the Ghost Farm go to war, one side takes heavy losses killing the other. If Vault City doesn't work with Gecko, their power generator breaks in a few years and everyone dies. And Broken Hills is doomed to fail if people don't get along and justice isn't served. That is a society that requires people to cooperate, or the whole operation falls apart and everyone dies in the race war as they blame each other for society failing. The parallels between the Enclave and Vault City in particular is the most direct. The first major conflict in the game being remarkably similar to the final one, with two genocidal maniacs ready to kill all they consider to be non-human freaks that need to be cleansed so they can rebuild humanity for the pure. 
to wipe away opportunity to grow together instead of cooperation being the first option. The difference is, Lynette has checks and balances to stop her. While the Enclave is a dictatorship not bound by the reasonable aspects of democracy, they are free to make all the impulsive, easy decisions they want. Do you know what the real hard choice is? Of course you do, I mentioned it earlier. It's trying to improve the world and cooperate with people to rebuild and move forward from this apocalyptic tragedy the Enclave is responsible for, and take accountability while doing what they can to make things right. There isn't even any remorse for those whose lives they ruined or the people they left to die, but instead they took the easy way. They disappeared and sulked far away from everyone and were too ashamed to confront their mistakes, and instead decided to kill everyone that saw and experienced their civilization-ending blunder. The world can still be fixed, and they seek to leave it as a mess and go on to the next world to ruin and avoid all accountability. They're like a kid who doesn't want to clean up their mess, and instead either leaves the mess and makes another mess elsewhere if they go with the leave the planet plan, or they do clean up their mess, with a flamethrower that fully destroys the mess and everything around it so they can just build a new house to destroy by themselves. And that's the wipe the slate clean plan they have opted for here. I seriously don't understand how some people see the Enclave as the good guys, and want to join them in some games. Like, my brother in Christ, they want to kill you for being muty scum, and don't even try to say you'd be born into it if you were in this universe. So there's my hot take for the video. Authoritarianism and genocide is bad, actually. Although Fallout 3 has a little more to be said about whether the Enclave can be good guys or not. Anyway, after the conversation with the president, he doesn't order people to kill you, even though you say where you're from for some reason in the middle of the conversation. He is a zealot and doesn't care if he dies. The plan will go ahead anyway and America will prevail, and do totally moral things. Thanks, President Dick Richardson. Fun fact, Dick is short for Richard somehow? That's right, it's President Richard Richardson. If you thought I was going to say something else, you think too lowly of me, because I usually go for the second lowest hanging fruit. Now, you don't have to kill him, but there are several ways to kill the US President. In this video game, to be clear. Secret Service, please do not send your top agent my way, I've seen what he can do. You can have Richard overdose on super stim packs, you can hit him with a mallet, use a bomb. You can't talk sense into him so speech builds kind of fall apart because this entire facility is beyond the power of debate unless your preferred debate tactic is to hit him with a hammer, with one notable exception. Hey buddy, eugenics isn't a valid science. You can talk to the scientist who made the new FEV toxin and convince him of his immoral ways using your science skills. And if you go down that road, you have a genuinely fascinating conversation, where using some scientific reasoning, you can make a man dedicated to genocide feel remorse and agree that the destruction of the Enclave is the only way, using the FEV toxin to kill everyone on the base except you and the prisoners who he inoculates. Wow, genocide is just a solution to everything, isn't it? And that's how you use facts and logic to kill the President of the United States in this video game. Also take the president's keycard. But while I'm here, I might as well free my people by turning the reactor off so that power goes out and the force fields containing them disappear, and they find their way to the boat somehow. But how do we stop the reactor? Perhaps this keycard I picked up all the way at the beginning of the game will finally come in handy. Nope, as it turns out, it has no use and should have been cut from the game. The real solution, as always, is C4. And so begins an epic escape from the base with a 10 minute countdown, so I leisurely walk to the entrance in just over a minute. But there is one major obstacle still in my way. However, before that, I am going to take some of my remaining time to get more of this Enclave slash Fallout rant out of my system, and remind us what we're fighting for. Despite everything that has happened to this world, there is still hope. People are doing what they always have. Rebuild and even innovate to create new technologies and ways of making life better. This is a world worth saving. And yet the Enclave cannot see that. They are incapable of seeing the world as anything other than a failure as something that needs to be cleared away like rubble to build their new world, with no one else to mess it up. But they are wrong. This world is anything but a failure. The world of Fallout is a testament to humanity's ability to persevere even in the worst conditions. Humanity has not failed until the last person draws their last breath. The Enclave thinks that the world is on its last legs, but it's anything but that. Everywhere you look is horror from our past, but also hope for the future. While the world is haunted by our mistakes, we persevere in spite of this. While Vault City has slaves and Reno has gambling and crime, it's actually inspiring because we have moved past the need to kill each other for selfish gains. People still do it of course, but not always out of necessity. You can measure how stable a civilization is by how people screw each other over. A chaotic society has everyone kill each other for resources. A more civilized one has people scam each other with cryptocurrency, I mean gambling. It's actually a bit of a relief to see people suffer from societal reasons and not the world itself being cruel because society is always changing. Even when these conflicts are ancient and seemingly never-ending like the Great Khans and NCR, or come from prejudice like Broken Hills or Vault City, it can always change. If war cannot change, then people should. 
And that is the main thesis of Fallout. Ulysses even spells it out for you in Fallout New Vegas' Lonesome Road DLC. If war doesn't change, men must change. Now that I have solved the moral conflict, it's time for the final conflict, because you can't just walk out of here. Well, you can, but let's just take a moment to appreciate the walking nuclear warhead Frank Horrigan. You've gotten a lot farther than you should have, but then you haven't met Frank Horrigan either. Your ride's over, Muty. Time to die. It's like every word he says is a knife. Michael Dorn hit it out of the park with his performance here, and the model is amazing. His helmet is so clearly distinct from the other three Enclave Power Armor models in the game, and his eyes are red instead of the orange other Enclave Power Armors have. And the way they modeled it so that it's very clear he is looking down on you, with the shadows and the way his neck is craned, th this model's perfect, no notes. But what isn't perfect is Frank himself, and no, I'm not talking about his stats, those are perfect. But you may notice that, despite clearly being a mutant, he hates mutants with a passion. As far as he and the Enclave are concerned, he is the one good mutant. After all, he is the strongest there is and kills other mutants with brutal efficiency. The Enclave only keeps him around because he's useful and undyingly loyal. But the moment he steps out of line, the President can have the turrets turn on him. But in the meantime, he is a very useful and very dangerous tool. Everything about him accentuates how menacing he is. We have caught glimpses of his power over the course of this journey. He ordered the execution of some innocents. He resisted whatever Matt was trying to do. He punched one of our best friends in half. He is absurdly powerful. He was already a jacked member of the Enclave Secret Service. Then he was exposed to FEV at Mariposa and experimented on by the Enclave scientists who gave him an insane amount of drugs as he became a super mutant behemoth with cybernetic enhancements and custom power armor that cannot be bypassed by critical hits. And he has maxed out special stats with 999 hit points. He is the strongest entity in the franchise except maybe Liberty Prime and a legendary bloatfly, but we don't talk about the legendary bloatfly. This man is compared to the atomic bomb for a reason, and he is the only thing standing between you and freedom. But let's see if we can talk things out. We just did. Time for talking's over. Well, but it was worth a shot, and honestly, I respect him for it. He sticks to his guns, unlike most villains. Now, you could say this is a bad thing, as it's eliminating a player choice and it defeats a pacifist run, but this actually harkens all the way back to the start of the game, where What's His Name says there will come a time where diplomacy doesn't work. And on the surface level, he may seem right. But I never said diplomacy was always peaceful and I can still use speech to get out of this, by using my words to not talk down Horrigan, but to talk up his own men into fighting him so they can escape this doomed place. Which is an elegant way to work speech into a final boss fight. And oh boy is it a fight. To defeat this hulking hypocritical beast, we need every ally we can get and rise against him together. You can also use the weapons he wields against him by turning the turrets against him with the President's paranoia, so you can easily beat the final boss without firing a single shot yourself. But this is all optional. If you wish to fight him alone, you can't. The turrets and troops are either on his side or yours. And even ignoring that, it is far from easy. He has perfect stats and the strongest weapons possible, but you can still beat him, and Isla here is more than willing to duel Frank to the death with nothing but a super sledge and a minigun. And his turrets. To distract the troops, because I still need something on my side, as this man is a beast. He is, after all, like a walking nuclear warhead. But the world and humanity have survived the worst man-made creations there are, and Horrigan is nothing but a bloated metaphor for the... uh... B police? I, I don't know, not all final bosses need to represent something. Alright Frank, you shouldn't have killed my Deathclaw friends, now it's personal. Oh... Uh, fuck it, we balled. At this rate, I'm going to run out of stim packs before he runs out of health. Oh, he ran out of ammo, that's great. Wait, is that a plasma knife? That's cool as shit! Okay, so this isn't working, so I'm going to do all the drugs and this rock that I found. I mean, it helped. I know you're Achilles' heel, Frank. Because I have a good idea of what body part was held when you were dipped in the vat of FEV. Ha! Knew it! Oh no, he's getting back up. Alright, it's looking pretty bad here. What can I use? Different minigun ammo? No. Wait. Is Bozar actually a heavy weapon? It's worth a shot. Well then, I'm very glad I went back for this, because now it's time for revenge.
How does it feel, Frank, to be beaten by mutie scum? To fail to protect those you're loyal to? And now you can't even protect yourself. This is the only way it could have ended. This is for the people of the Wasteland. This is for Matt. This is for Gruthar. And all the friends of mine you killed. This is the end for you, Horrigan. Someone has to put the last nail in your coffin, Frank. And I have the hammer to do it! Oh wow, his head popped off harder than this video in the YouTube algorithm. Whether that joke lands or not is up to you, the viewer, so make sure it works out by viciously assailing the like button from all sides, or it's your fault this isn't funny. But before he dies, Frank has one last thing to say. You... You haven't won here. You and your muty bastard friends are gonna join me in a big old mushroom cloud send-off. I just triggered the self-destruct. <laughs> Seal your own death warrants. Duty. <coughs> Honor. Courage. Semper Fi. Yeah, I already set the reactor to blow up. You didn't do anything here, Frank, except be a really cool boss fight. May the screams of mutants serenade you as you plunge to the deepest parts of hell. Also, my boat is literally right here. I'm fine, Frank. You would have just blown up your own government for nothing. Now, would a pacifist run still be intact after this? Yes, you can just walk right past him. But I probably wouldn't call the next bit a pacifist move. And so, having rescued your people and avenging your Deathclaw friends, you leave at the dawn of a new day, with two suns rising on the horizon. You definitely have a body count after that. Wait, we never went back to the room with Gorus and Marcus in it. I I'm sure they're fine. I would show you my ending, but I kind of forgot some things, so slavery thrived and I was blamed for the genocide of the Deathclaws for some reason. So I don't think I got a very good ending, but... This nerd died in obscurity to an ironic death, so that's good at least. And also my village reunited with the Vault Dwellers from Vault 13 and thrived with the Gek, which is alright I guess. But it's nice to see all the endings for everything you've done throughout the game, and also to hear Ron Perlman's voice. Now after destroying their base of operations, what has become of the Enclave for future games? Well they're refugees now. We made the government homeless. How ironic. Although technically your pacifist run is still intact if you believe everyone on the oil rig escaped into Fallout 3. Can't wait to talk about them again when I make that Fallout 3 video in like, three years? Given how long it's taken me to make this one. You'd think I'd be done talking about this game now that it's beaten. But there is actually a post game, and you can just go back to the Enclave oil rig like nothing happened. Hey Marcus and Goris, sorry I forgot to pick you up earlier when the base blew up, but let's go home now. There is also a fun little post-game secret where if you go back to New Reno and go to the Drunk Cupid Chapel and speak to the priest there, he gives you the Fallout 2 hint book, which humorously addresses the fact that it would have been really useful to have this at the beginning of the game, and it also gives you 300 in every skill and gives you 10,000 experience points every time you use it. I really like that. The game rewards you for beating it and knows you can already beat every enemy so it just makes it easier to explore what's left of the game and absolutely destroy the game's balance. So. I'm already in Reno, and Miss Bishop has probably left safely, so I can finally kill Mr. Bishop once and for all. That's the only way this video could have ended. Subscribe if you think I deserve to make money from these videos.